everyday witches emerge from the shadows of secrecy. Broom closets are flinging open and witches are taking flight. Whether you are hiding in your cozy closet or flying with pride, stay for a spell as witch casting with Theodora Pendragon and her guests share magical moments, stir the cauldron and debunk misinformation and misconceptions about paganism, witches and our wonderful world of magic. I am joined today by a special, special guest. Yes, he's double special because he was previously on the show in episode 13, which aired on March 8, 2023. Let's welcome Boniface Wolfsong. Hello, Boniface. Thank you for having me back. I invited you back to the show again because the months of April and May, I'm featuring veterans, military family members, and those who are currently serving in the armed forces. And you are a veteran. Yes, I am. What branch of service did you serve, and what years were you in? I served in the Navy, and uh, I'm an old-timer. I served between 1977 and 1982, and things were much different back then. So uh, uh, I'm kind of pleased with where things have gone today. I'm not very good at math, but if I'm a good guesser, I, I'm guessing that you were pagan before you went into the Navy. Uh, yes, I had become pagan in 1975, although I was leading towards paganism before that. 1973, I started practicing witchcraft. 75, I outright said, I feel I am pagan and claimed the title for myself. So by the time I went into the Navy in 77, I'd been pagan openly for two years. What was that like being pagan on active duty? Well, my first experience of the difference between my beliefs and the active duty personnel was in boot camp, actually. We were filling out forms for our dog tags, and the question was, what religion are you? Well, they had certain choices back then, and pagan was not one of the choices. So I wrote in pantheistic pagan. So the drill instructor comes over and he says, what is this? I said, I'm a pantheistic pagan. He says, what is that word? I said, pantheist. He says, do you know what that word means? I said, yes, I do. He says, what does it mean? So I gave him the definition, you know, briefly of what pantheist was. And he said, you are my education petty officer. Anybody that knows a word like that can help other people with their studies. (laughs) And, uh, So he took it as a plus. That that was not bad. And then he put no preference on my dog tags. I said, I do have a preference. I'm pagan. He said, no, it's not one of the choices. So no preference is the only other option. So what did they put on your dog tags? Religion, no preference. And that was all that was available back then. How did you feel about that, having no preference on your dog tags? Because you definitely had a preference. Oh, yes, definitely. And and I felt kind of slighted, of course. But back then, I knew that uh, the military was very, very strict. They only gave certain options. It was fill in the blank with one of these choices. And pagan was not one of the choices. So you couldn't do much about it. And that never changed for the duration of your service in the military? Correct. Uh, it, It didn't change until decades, I think, after I I left the military. You said that your first experience was in basic training. Did you have other experiences? Oh, yes. I was always open about my paganism. And after I left basic training, I went to my, what's called in the Navy, an A school. An A school is the first school you go to to learn your trade. And I was going to be a photographer because I was openly pagan. A lot of the other people going to A school to learn photography found out about this, 
and they were intensely interested. So I started to accrue a group of friends that were attending the school with me, and we were all interested in the occult, psychic phenomena, uh, witchcraft, paganism. And then we started doing experiments with telepathy, psychic abilities, and so on. And we actually had quite a good time. Some of the experiments were quite successful. That's a nice network of people you had there. There was a strange experience. I used to do meditations, and I was already astrally projecting by the time I got into the Navy. And, of course, they gave me a roommate in the barracks, and he was a Marine. They trained Marines along with the Navy in the photography school. So I was doing a meditation one night, and I astrally projected, and I consciously chose the image of a wolf to project as. And I jumped out of the window as a wolf, and I roamed around the base and came back, and I went to sleep. The next day, this Marine said, I had a very interesting dream last night. And he said, I didn't think it was a dream at first, but you were a werewolf and you were staring at me. And I thought if I moved in my bed at all, you would jump at me. So I had to reveal to him, I said, I was doing a meditation. And he took it with a grain of salt. But later in the day, he comes at me and he tosses this garland of garlic at me. And I said, what is this? (laughs) He says, I'm checking. (laughs) So... He says, I didn't think it was a dream. It was so vivid. He became (laughs) one of my best experimenters. uh, I I practiced some hypnosis on him. He began to see auras. He began to actually project himself. It was uh, quite fruitful. And we became very, very good friends. He did have to check first to see if I was a real werewolf. And throwing that garland of garlic at me was his test. (laughs) <laughs> That's a neat story. Yeah. It sounds like you had a few positive experiences in the Navy being pagan. It, actually, it was almost, uh, I would say, 95 to 98% positive. I had one bad experience. It was later when I went to a B school. A B school was a more advanced school in photography. And they put me with a roommate that was a born again Christian course, I was open, and he began to tell me daily that I was going to hell, and that I was condemned, and so on. I said, okay, it's not a problem. I really don't care what you believe. You know, it's it's your belief. My belief is my belief. But he would get very, very angry. Well, one time I got a little annoyed, and he said to me, if you get angry, the devil has gone into you. And if the devil is in you, You can't say, Jesus loves me. So I'd gotten angry, and he said, say, Jesus loves me. So I stopped, and I said, Jesus loves me. He said, okay, the devil wasn't in you. Well, later on, a few days, he got angry, and I said, stop, say, Jesus loves me. His belief so tethered him that he could not stop his anger and say, Jesus loves me. He was bound by his own belief that the devil had gotten into him. And it was a very curious state that, It actually bound him, but not me. That was the only real bad experience I had. Did he try to talk to you about that a lot? You going to hell because that was his belief? Oh, yeah, almost daily. And he tried to prove that his God was real. I I was a philosophy major in college. I said, you really can't prove that your God is real or not real. That's not something you can prove. I said, if I were to turn my back on those wall lockers over there, you could not prove to me that those wall lockers are back there behind me. I would have to experience it for myself. And this is actually what got him very annoyed and angry. As I said, um, philosophically, although you can tell me the lockers are back there, I have no experience of it if my back is turned. So that annoyed him immensely because he kept saying the lockers are there. (laughs) I just had to laugh. Uh, I knew philosophically you can't prove somebody else's, uh, your own experience to someone else. That's a good analogy. Yeah, he couldn't quite grasp that. How long did you live with him? I I think it was about, uh, I'd say a month and a half or two. Uh, We were in uh, advanced school. It wasn't very long. Oh, that's fortunate. 
Did you ever run into him again later? Online one time. Uh, we had joined a group on Facebook that was alumni of the photographic school. And I said, oh, it's you. I'll be damned. Of course, that didn't go <laughs> over well. So he didn't talk to me. And how much time had passed when you found him online? Oh, I'd say um, maybe 30 years. He knew who I was immediately. <laughs> there, There's that devil worshiper. <laughs> yep. I know you can chuckle about it. I can chuckle about those things, too, when people tell me that. Yeah. I had so many good experiences in the Navy, though, that it kind of overrides that. And my witchcraft actually helped me quite a bit in the Navy. For example, if, if I could tell you about an experience, when I went to my first duty station, I was stationed down in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And I got down there, and of course, I was open about paganism again with my roommate. And he was a fellow from Vermont, and he was very open about it, and he was interested. Well, I had an astral projection. And it was early in the year that I spent down in Gitmo. And I dreamt that I was on an aircraft carrier. I had stood on the flight deck, put my hands in my pocket and looked out, and I was in the middle of the desert. I could see no ocean. So I came out of the projection and I told my roommate, I said, I think when I get orders at the end of this year, I'm going to be going to an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. And I explained the vision to him. And he said, okay, let's write it down and see if, in fact, you get orders to the Mediterranean and a carrier. So at the end of the year, I get orders, and it was to a carrier, but it was going to the Pacific. He says, ah, you got that wrong. I said, well, let's see what else happens. Within, I'd say, a couple of weeks, my orders were changed to a carrier going to the Mediterranean. I said, there, I got it right. He says, yeah, but what about the desert? I said, I can't explain that. Well, I finally went to the carrier, and I spent two and a half years on the carrier, coming back on my final voyage from the, uh, actually from the Persian Gulf. We came through the Suez Canal. I decided, I told my crew, because I was in the Photoshop in the Intelligence Center, I'm going to go up topside and take a look around. So I went up, and I stood on the flight deck, stuck my hands in my pocket, and we were in the narrowest part of the Suez Canal. I could not see the ocean. You had to go over to the edge to look down. All I saw was desert around me. And that was exactly the vision that I had seen almost three years before. So it came out exactly right. And that's why I like to tell people, don't edit your visions. Sometimes something that you don't understand is going to come out and be accurate. And it was like a ship in the desert. How could that be? And it was because I was coming through the Suez Canal. That's neat. Yeah, it's just like, you know, you were told that you're going one place and then you got orders for the other place. It, it changed. Anything can change from day to day, but everything came the way you predicted. Yep. And I didn't understand the vision when it first occurred to me, but it did, in fact, occur just the way it happened. See, and that, that's another thing that I'd like to talk about is because I was young, and I joined the Navy when I was 21 years old, I left it when I was 26, I was young and I was missing home a lot. Because of that, it actually was very conducive to my astrally projecting. Because I would want to go back home. I would want to visit my girlfriend from in college. So I was constantly projecting back and seeing things that were happening back at home. For example, my girlfriend, I met her in San Antonio. and We dated when we were in San Antonio. After I joined the Navy, she moved to Houston to go to school there. I actually projected and saw her walking home from school across a strip mall and past an alley. And there were three guys in the alley. Now, the strip mall, I told her, I, I called her, I said, there's a strip mall that you walk home to, uh, from school. And in the strip mall was a Mexican bakery and a laundromat. And then there's an alley. I said, there's three guys there that wish to do you harm. She goes, I know exactly the place you're talking about. Yes, in fact, I do walk there. I said, well, don't walk there at night. These guys want to hurt you. Now, I had not been to Houston. 
Yet, actually, I picked up exactly the location that she walked in, and she stopped walking there at night. So she was never injured. And she knew exactly the place you were talking about. Yep, because I mentioned the Mexican bakery right next to the laundromat and then the alley. And she goes, I know the place. You saved her. I think I did. You were in the service, what, five years? Yes. And you had mostly good experiences being pagan in the military. Correct. Except for the one roommate, I can't think of anybody else that had a problem with it. Except the dog tag issue. Yeah, and that was kind of an official thing. It was kind of like the uh, the pentagram cemetery, you know, tombstone thing. The Navy is stuck in the past, and it takes them quite a while to change things. But they have to do it formally and going through all this red tape. And it was the same thing with the no preference on religion. They hadn't gone through the red tape at that time. It was very early on. Uh, luckily, things have changed now. We are accepted much more for who we are. We are. Did you have any issues with your chain of command at all? No, I, I didn't. In fact, because I was kind of creative in the way I work things, I, I was one of the first people to institute learning through VHS tapes. I had to teach certain pilots on the carrier how to operate the cameras while they were in their jets. And rather than staying up 24-7, I said, why don't, and I told my commander, I said, why don't I put the lessons on tape and they can view them at their leisure whenever they have time? He goes, that's a great idea. So I actually lectured the pilots through VHS tapes and they would plug it in. Doing things like that kind of um, helped me get along with my commanders really well because they love me for creative ideas. So they saw you as the person, not the crazy stories that people believe from Hollywood. Yeah, they didn't really care what I believed as long as I was benefiting the, the mission. And the mission was of primary importance. And as long as I was benefiting that, who cared what I believed? Did you ever have an altar in your room when you were in the barracks or on the ship? No, there was actually no room for an altar. Uh, the ship, basically, you have a bunk. And I'd say between the mattress and the bunk above you, there's about a foot, maybe a foot and a half of space. And your clothes go underneath the bunk. And you have no other room, so there's no place for an altar. In the workplace, there was no room there. Space is at a premium on a carrier. Even though it's quite a large ship, you don't have a lot of space to you. It sounds like a prison. In fact, I worked with somebody that had been in Huntsville Prison, and I described the conditions on the ship. And he said he had it better in prison than we did on the ship. I believe that. I've talked to Navy people. I've heard many stories about what it's like to live in a ship for a long time. Yeah, it can be quite challenging. I think that's one of the reasons when we hit port, we kind of go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I know that we were asked to leave Athens because we were kind of tearing up the town with our with our partying. But we've been out at sea for quite some time when we hit Athens. So Athens actually asked us to leave. What else can you expect? You have these sailors on the ship for several months, and they can't party on the ship. And then you go to the port, and you just party it up. And from what I understand, there are even women that are waiting for the ship to come in. Yeah. Um, they make their living that way. And when you're a sailor and you only have a day or two in port, you haven't got time to... Uh, to court anybody, so you have to uh, type the most available port <laughs> available. So, yes, these women are waiting. They wait at the at the pier. So you have all these sailors getting drunk, hanging out, tearing up the place, getting in trouble. So, what usually happens is that the people in Athens probably think all Americans are like that. That's probably where they get their idea. Now, interestingly, uh, because I worked in the intelligence center, I got to see some uh, intelligence from the other Navy. At the time, the Cold War was going on, 
and the Soviet ships would stay out at sea. We'd stay out at sea for about six months. Soviet ships could stay out at sea for a year to a year and a half. And we were amazed that they could stay out at sea that long. But then we took some aerial photographs of a ship and we were studying them. And one of the officers on, uh, in the intelligence center said, do you know what that is? I said, no, I don't. What is it? He says, that is a brothel boat. The Soviets send out a brothel ship to service the sailors out at sea. That's why they can stay out so long. I went, whoa, now there's a totally different attitude. Wow, some lucky sailors, huh? Lucky Russian sailors. Evidently. <laughs> When we hit port, we were already going stir crazy. The Soviets were not, they'd been taken care of out at sea. After 1982, did you have really much to do with the military, the military community at all? Uh, yes, I did. I began to do contract work at Lackland Air Force Base as a photographer. I did a lot of police work, portraiture, uh, I actually took uh, pictures of quite a few suicides and things like that. But more than that, because I began to know the people there, I was asked by a fellow that was running a Wiccan meeting every Sunday for the basic trainees if I would talk to them. And I said, sure. And at the time, there was only about uh, two to 300 people attending the Wiccan services on Sunday. But they received it really well. Now, interestingly, the number of people going to the Wiccan services has increased, I've heard, quite a lot. This was about five years ago that I did this, and it, like I said, there was only about 300 people in the audience. Now, today, I hear there's, it's up to about 800 people. So there's quite an interest in the military for this, uh, for this religion. That's really exciting. I have been told repeatedly that paganism is increasing in the military very quickly. Yes, it is. In fact, uh, I believe there's one fellow that he is just about to get his clergy status and become a chaplain, the first Wiccan chaplain. Uh, that would really be great. Yes, the military needs a Wiccan chaplain, I believe. It could be a little more open, I think, than it is. Uh, Sometimes we're not allowed to use certain facilities on base. I, I think some of the Christian chaplains have a problem with sharing certain facilities with other religions, especially Wiccan or pagan. But they have accommodated us by having an open circle outside with an actual altar and stones and so on. Unfortunately, some people take it kind of badly that it's there. They have turned over the stones and marked it up with spray paint and so on. And it was cleaned up immediately, but that has happened. Yeah, why do people have to do that? I think it's because they're afraid that their own faith is not as strong as it could be. And anything that goes against their opinion or their faith is taken as a direct threat. Whereas me, as a Wiccan... If you have faith in your religion, more power to you. I, I really don't mind. I don't care. I support you in your religion. You having faith in something else does not harm me at all. If they had the same opinion, I think things would be a whole lot better, not only in the military, but everywhere else. It would be. Unfortunately, people that I don't think have a strong enough faith do take other religions as a threat. Well, they want you to join their team. I think if they can get you to join their team, they feel like they, well, I can't possibly be wrong because, look, somebody has joined. And the more people on their team, the more they feel good about their decision to be on that team. And that's the thing that I believe is they're seeing it as a team sport. It's us against them. But the way I practice my religion, it's not a team sport at all. In fact, there's no competition. I support your belief. I support all beliefs out there because there's many paths to the one. And my path is just one among many. It's not the one way. It's not the correct way. It's just a way, a way among many. It's your way. Exactly. It's good for me, but it may not be good for you or anybody else. 
And I think that's one of the reasons why in the military, I got along well with so many people is because I didn't push my religion on them. The people that came around me and were interested came around me because they wanted to be. And we did a lot of, uh, like I, I said, it's experiments with psychic abilities and so on. There was one lady I remember distinctly. She said that she was very psychic. And I said, I'm very psychic. So we started doing experiments with one another. And because I was in photo school, we had witnesses. And I remember one time we laid down on the floor head to head. And I said, I want you to receive energy. I'm going to push energy. Well, the witnesses around her, and it was kind of a semi-darkened room, began to see this arc of light coming over from my third eye and my solar plexus going over into her. They saw it so clearly, so visibly, they thought they could take a photograph of it. Now, the photograph didn't come out, but they distinctly saw it, all of them. And I had about six people in the room. All of them saw the same thing. Yep, exactly. That's magic. Yep. Now, speaking of magic, I did do one spell towards the end of my Navy career. I was on the carrier, and I had about, I'd say, 10 months left to my enlistment. I wanted off the carrier, like I said. Being on a ship is really quite constrictive. So I wanted off the ship. I submitted my request to be taken back to home, to Texas, and I wanted to be stationed in Texas. I was told by my supervisors, you're not going to get orders to Texas. This close to the end of your uh, enlistment, the Navy, Navy never changes your posting. So I said, just submit my request, and I started to do a spell. I drew a pentagram. And the four elements, I put symbols in each of the pentagram points representing my request according to that element. And then I put one that related to the spirit and then a center symbol. And I meditated on this for about a month when I got orders and they sent me to Beeville, Texas, with only nine months left in my enlistment. Uh, nobody could believe it happened. And that was because of the spell, I believe. Did you tell anybody that? I told my roommate at the time. Well, one of my roommates, because I was on the ship. I had 30 people as roommates. That's neat. I believe in magic. Yep. Magic works for me, too. Yeah, it got me off that ship with only nine months left. And, and that was something unheard of. I was told, I, I can't believe that you got this. And I put it down to working that spell. Do you have any more pagan military stories? Well, this lady that said she was psychic and we laid on the floor, we did another experiment in which she said, I want to get into a little battle with you. I want to see if we can control the other person. I said, how do you mean control? She said, well, I'd like, and she was from the Dominican Republic. I remember that. She said, I want to see if I can make you sick. I said, sick? She goes, yes. I want to see if I can put a curse on you. I said, okay, do you want me to do it back? She goes, defend yourself however you want. So we decided, okay, let's start this little contest and see who wins. Now, I don't know what she did, but what I did was in my head, I said, I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you send to me bounces and sticks to you. That was it. And then I ignored her. Well, a few days later, one of her friends approaches me and says, stop whatever you're doing. She's very, very ill. She hasn't been to work in three days. I said, okay, tell her I stopped. I wasn't doing anything. Evidently, everything that she was doing was rebounding and hitting her. And she made herself very sick. When I told her, okay, I stopped, I really didn't stop. I wasn't doing anything. But she got better almost immediately. Did you ever tell her what your spell was? Uh, yeah. <laughs> she thought it was funny. That is funny. I think the lesson in that is sometimes when you intend somebody else harm, you're actually harming yourself more than anybody else. 
And by my just relaxing and saying, it's not going to hurt me, it didn't. I believe that 100%. One thing I have to say about being pagan in the military is because I was open so much, people tend to come out of the woodwork. I encountered so many friends and people that were interested in this that wouldn't have happened to me if I had kept secret about my religion or my beliefs. So be open, take a chance. They will come out of the woodwork. And you also will attract the right people into your life. I I believe that as well. In fact, I've experienced it. Like I said, one instance in five years that was negative compared to dozens and dozens of positive experiences, it, it far outweighs the negative. And no matter who we are, and no matter what we do or what we look like, we're going to have people who just don't like it. You can't have everybody like you. you know. Accept that and you'll be fine. Not everybody's going to agree with you. Thank you, Boniface, for being my special, special guest in another entertaining episode. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us for Witch Casting with Theodora Pendragon. Have a burning question or have a topic you'd love Theodora and her guests to discuss on the show? Contact her through Instagram at Theodora Pendragon. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And help us spread the word by leaving us a rating and review and sharing it with your friends. See you next time, and may your magic always shine. <laughs>